Hi guys, after our rigorous calculations of the transmission coefficient for the potential barrier, now we can perform our analysis of it. Let's adjust these values of energy, potential and uh, width of the barrier to see what we can get out of the transmission coefficient and whether they're similar or not to the potential step. So today we're talking about the potential barrier, the analysis of the transmission coefficient T. Okay? So previously, our transmission coefficient after our rigorous calculations is given by this expression over here. Okay, it's one plus a quarter of all these terms, but now we have the hyperbolic uh, sign, hyperbolic sign, right? Uh, hyperbolic sign squared, and we got the K2A. And again, I say it's to the power of minus one. So if you want to look at it, please look at it. It's one divided by this expression over here. Right? And then as always, this is basically already what we have. Our transmission coefficient really solved it and it's this given as so. But we want to really write it in a more manageable form so that we can analyze it. So since K, this expression, okay, K1 squared plus K2 squared divided by K1 times K2 whole thing squared, which is this over here, is given by this, okay, after really do, doing some simplification of K1 and K2, which you know is the, the idea of the square root 2 me or the square root v naught minus e, we do all that, we get this over here, right? So now we want to substitute this inside here, writing the transmission coefficient expli explicitly in terms of the energy, the potential, and the width of the barrier A, and obviously the mass of the particle. And then from here, we also want to just rearrange some terms, okay, similar to what we did for the potential step. Now, over here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to divide top and bottom by a v naught uh, squared, okay? So I'm going to divide top and bottom by that. For this case, the argument inside the hyperbolic sine squared, I'm going to divide top and bottom, okay? Oh, sorry, yeah, divide top and bottom, or modify top and bottom by the, the square root of uh, v naught, right? Okay, so when we do that, we see that this v naught squared is equal to 1, okay? Because I'm going to divide by v naught squared. And for down here, I can distribute the v naught squared between the e and the v naught. So ultimately, what I'm left with is basically um, epsilon 1 minus epsilon, right? Uh, epsilon is equal to energy minus by v naught. So I immediately write it as such. And when I do that over here, the same thing, I would have... Uh, V, uh, square root of V naught outside, okay, square root of V naught outside, okay, A, so, and then when I do the same thing over here, I have 1 minus epsilon, the same thing, okay, 1 minus epsilon, because now I can divide by the, by the square root of V naught, bring it inside the square root, and again, I want to simplify this and writing this whole thing as lambda square root of 1 minus epsilon, uh, close bracket and close bracket again to the minus 1. Okay. The reason I'm doing all this is because now it's much easier for me to perform an analysis because all I need to do is to adjust ratios of the energy and the potential V0, thereby adjusting values of epsilon, changing the transmission coefficient, and do the same for lambda. But lambda is dictated by the potential and the width of the barrier A. So let's do this analysis on this transmission coefficient. Right, so at this point, you solve the problem and maybe you are an applied physicist, you want to really uh, just immediately go to the interesting results. You will just want to immediately graph this thing out, okay, which is uh, why I plotted the axis over there. And when we graph it out, what we have is something like this, right? No, there is no, um, yeah, you can use graphing techniques, but the idea is maybe just use some graphing software, use a TI-89, just graph the thing out. And you get a graph something like this, okay? I'm, I'm not sure whether it is it scaled correctly, but never mind, it's something like that. But what we need to pay careful attention of is that Epsilon, okay, or values of the transmission coefficient for epsilon does not exist when epsilon is equal to zero, which, which is why we put a circle over there, and when epsilon is equal to one. Okay, and so yes, we may have concluded that epsilon goes up to one. I say that because remember, our conditions of the problem is that the energy is greater than zero, but is less than the potential V0. Okay, so if we divide this, the energy by V0, um, epsilon will be less than one, and epsilon has to be greater than zero. That's why these two points does not exist. Right? That's why I, I'm refrained from putting values 0 or whatever value, okay, that I value this over here because they do not exist. What I also want to say is that when plot against an axis, when the, the transmission coefficient runs from 0 to 1, 1 is over here, okay? So, now, what does it tell us graphically? It tells us that we cannot get full transmission of particles, right? Full transmission of particles for now. For now, because as long as we adjust values of epsilon, um, which is adjusting values of the energy and the potential, we cannot reach the full transmission of our particles. It's uh, not gonna work. All right. So again, graph it out. Graphical analysis. We got the analytical analysis, but now we want to do more of the heavy analysis uh, to see what what we tell us from this. Okay. So we consider special cases, but for now, I want to say that lambda is fixed. So lambda is fixed is also implies that the width of the barrier is fixed. Later, we can adjust the width of the barrier and see what other things we get. So. 
the first case, let's just say that the energy of the particle is much less than the potential, right? So energy e is much less than V0. Now when this happens, as we can see from here, epsilon will be much less than 1. Right? Yes, that's correct. And in doing so, we see that lambda multiplied by the square root of 1 minus epsilon is much greater than 1. Okay? Why? Because when we look over here, we see that as epsilon is much less than 1, this is, it will be insignificant compared to 1 over here. So basically, this is going to be uh, much greater than 1 because we're going to multiply it by a lambda. Okay, and when we have this, we approximate okay, this function, which is the hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic sine of lambda square root of 1 minus epsilon is approximated as half at, uh, half to the transcendental number e raised to the power of lambda uh, square root of 1 minus e. Alright, now, how do we get this? Uh, basically, it's using your simple hyperbolic functions. Okay, so sine h is equal to, we got a half, and then we got uh, uh, e to the x minus e to the minus x. Right? So this is what we have. So as you can see, this one over here, e to the minus x, is basically 1 divided by e to the x. But since now the power is given by lambda square root of 1 minus epsilon is greater than 1, um, e raised to the power of something greater than 1 is basically a very huge number. 1 divided by that huge number is equal to 0. So that's why this term is irrelevant. Okay, So we only got the half over here. Now this is good because what we can do now is that we can substitute this um, half multiplied by the e to the lambda square root of 1 minus epsilon inside over here, Okay, the hyperbolic sign. And then later we take the square of that. So, I, I, so I'm going to substitute this inside the hyperbolic sign, but I need to square that, which is what I get over here for our transmission coefficient, the square that. But now, I'm at liberty to neglect the 1 over here, okay? I'm in liberty to neglect the 1 over there. Well, why is that the case? Well, um, let's just see. Now, I know that epsilon, okay, is much less than 1, okay? But it's still finite. Epsilon, it still takes a finite value because the energy has to be greater than, than 0. That is why one of the reasons why we do not write this thing of epsilon is approximately equals to 0. We don't write that because the energy cannot be equal to 0. Therefore, the ratio cannot equal to 0. But what I can say is that if epsilon is much smaller than 1, okay, I see that my expression over here, 1 minus a, a number that is much smaller than 1, I get 1, right? So this term still, still uh, is prevalent. But I got uh, epsilon over here. So I'm going to take 1 divided by whatever this small number is. I will, I'll be sure to get a big number, right? I'll be sure to get a big number. Not only that, when I multiply by this um, half to the e raised to a certain uh, number, which is greater than 1 also, which would be substituted inside here, I'll get a big number over here, and that's why this one is negligible. Okay, that's why this one is negligible, and that's why I've left it out. Okay, I'm at liberty to do that. But what's more important is that I substitute this expression inside here, and then you know I, I get uh, this thing. Okay, then I simplify it. I will square that, and then I'll get something like this. Substituting back inside uh, the terms of the energy and the potential v naught and the width of the barrier given by lambda and epsilon, and this is what I ultimately get. This value corresponds to the value over here. All right, where epsilon is much less than 1 or in, in more uh, simplified terms where the energy is much smaller than the potential. Okay, the point which we say it kind of didn't exist. This is actually corresponds to the transmission coefficient over here. So T is equals, we got this idea of the 16 energy divided by uh, V0, da da da. Okay, so this corresponds to that over there. Now, this is all, uh, definitely valid because I did not have the idea of dividing by zero when I dealt with the transmission coefficient. Yes, I say that epsilon is much less than one, but then now I, I have resolved the problem of dividing by zero, okay? Which is why I said the point didn't exist. But now, as epsilon tends towards this point, as epsilon tends towards this point, the transmission coefficient that we will get is given by this over here. Okay, by doing all these approximations, now I know what the point is over there. Okay, so that is the case number one. Okay, so now case number two, I want to go to the extreme end. I want to let epsilon tend towards one, and let's see what is the value I get over there. Okay, well, this is where something uh, will show up, something familiar will show up. Now, this happens, okay, when the energy is uh, approximately equal to the potential. Okay, so I got this energy bar over here, the potential is over here. Previously, we got the energy of the particle, we have decreased it so that it's much smaller compared to the potential, but now we will increase the energy so that the energy would be approximately equal to the potential as given by that over there. Now, when this happens, we say that epsilon tends towards one, okay? But, you know, we discussed just now that epsilon cannot be equal to one because I got the idea of dividing by zero, but never mind, because now I got epsilon tends towards one, we can verify that when we do all that similar calculations, okay, and notice that now I'm at liberty to substitute one inside here, this epsilon here, but not the term over here, okay, but when I do that, I will get this transmission coefficient. Now, if you have a keen eye, this is actually the transmission coefficient of the potential step. 
potential step, okay, when we let the energy, which was initially above the potential, okay, drop all the way to the uh, potential V0 over here. Okay, sorry, it's the potential barrier. Yeah, it's the potential barrier where we let the energy uh, starting from more than V0 drop all the way over here. So as you can see, if the energy goes from the bottom or goes from the top, tends towards V0, we get the same result. Now, if you want to perform a full anal analytical method to get that result, what you actually need to do is to do something like that, okay? The limit as epsilon tends towards 1 of the hyperbolic sine squared, okay, lambda 1 take away e and divided by uh, 1 minus epsilon, sorry, 1 minus epsilon divided by 1 minus epsilon, take the limit as epsilon tends towards 1. Now, this can be done because as epsilon tends towards 1, 1 minus epsilon, we get 0. 1 minus epsilon at the top, we also get 0. Hyperbolic sine of 0 is 0. We get the 0 over the 0 indeterminate form via the Hopital's rule. We can differentiate top and bottom, and then by substituting back inside, we'll get the same thing. Okay, but this takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes to do. So that's why I wrote the expression out immediately. Alright, so that's what happens when the energy is approximately equal to the potential.